Potty, this is my favorite time of year. I'm finally done with racing. I'm done with training. Every single ride I'm doing right now is for fun, period. I am mountain biking, I swear, every single day. Haven't touched my road bike in months. And the colors in the mountains near where I live here in Utah are changing. The scrub oaks are bright oranges and reds. I mean, colors that you just would not believe. I am loving it. Yeah, I've seen some pictures from uh, Leadville and the Aspens are, you know, turning their colors up there too. It looks mm. like a beautiful time of year to be in Leadville right now. I don't know, you're done with racing? I have a race coming up, actually. Gravelero up in uh, Bakersfield. So uh, looking forward to that. It's uh, obviously a drop bar dirt event uh, but you know definitely this is the time of year for relaxing recovering telling some stories which is oh, yeah. what these post season two episodes are all about yeah and i am super excited about the interview slash storytelling session we've got today we've got a great story it's equal parts inspiring and funny and it's quite a bit different from most leadville stories i have ever heard and of course, we've got the uh, relax and recover part of the equation covered here too, thanks to Floyd's of Leadville, our presenting sponsor at floydsofleadville.com. That's where you find all the products. The race season may be over, but the benefits of CBD, as well as the Friends of the Leadville podcast discount, go on. Just use the code FATTY at checkout for a 15% discount on your first two orders. And thanks, Floyd's of Leadville, for sponsoring the show. <laughs> Leadville, the podcast for the 100-mile mountain bike race presented by Floyd's of Leadville, Season 2, Episode 25, kind of a bonus episode to our show that breaks down, builds up, gets you ready, freaks you out for the highest and hardest one-day mountain bike race in the country. Yeah, welcome to the first of a few postseason episodes of the show. We've got a lineup of some great stories from this year's race. Hottie, for the first time ever this last year, about the time I came through Twin Lakes inbound around you know, mile 62, 63, I noticed a rider at the very back of the race coming in the opposite direction, you know, about to get uh, come into Twin Lakes outbound, and he had a race plate that said sweep on it. Have you ever noticed sweepers on the course before? Well, uh, thankfully, I have not. Uh, in other words, I've never had one of them approach me and advise me that I might be near the back of the race. Uh, and actually, prior to prepping for this show, I did not know there were sweepers other than the cleanup crew at the end of the race. With yeah, the rooms. I, uh, <laughs> I, I w had not noticed them until seeing the plate this year. So I, maybe it's new. We'll have to ask. Anyway, a couple of days after the race, you and I got this email from Joe, who is one of the two sweepers on the course this year. And we're going to let him explain which part of the course he swept and why in a second. But I got to tell you, Hadi, his story completely gripped me. Yeah, the same reaction, Fatty. It was funny and gripping and a little sad sometimes and weird. And to be honest, it sounded like a much harder day on the bike than I would have thought. Yeah, me too. Uh, so for this episode, we're super excited to have Joe Stein, who is one of this year's Leadville Trail 100 sweepers, to tell us tales from the very back of the race. But first, we want to give a shout out and some thanks to our sponsors of the show this year. Yeah, first, let's start with The Feed, who fueled us through the whole season. In fact, continues to fuel us in our postseason rides with Morton Drink Mix. Be sure to go to thefeed.com and use the code LEADVILLE15 for a 15% discount on Morton Drink Mix and gels. Yeah, they got a new caffeinated uh, gel, so I haven't tried that yet. I'm kind of interested to see how that tastes. Uh, and a little bit about Shimano as well. Hottie, uh, Shimano's been such a huge part of uh, honestly every single ride i do this year i'm wearing s fire socks i'm wearing their s fire glasses and shoes xt di2 is on two of my mountain bikes and the incredible new xtr is on my epic hardtail that i raced in leadville this year uh go to bike shimano.com for information about the best bike drive trains shoes pedals glasses helmets tools really almost everything but the frame they have two frames Mm -hmm. Banjo Brothers has also been with us since the very beginning of this show, and it's been amazing how often we saw their saddlebags in Leadville this year. It was. It makes great, great sense, though. You know, they are tough, practical, and affordable, 
Get 15% off your saddlebag, commuter bag, frame bag, phone wallet, lots of other things cyclists need in order to carry around your stuff. Just go to banjobrothers.com forward slash fatty dash favorites. Yeah, and get a great discount there. And last but not least, this season has been sponsored by Envy. If it weren't for the M525 wheel hottie, I would have three mountain bikes with no wheels at all. <laughs> that would suck. Yeah. Uh, I don't ever change my wheels. Uh, I, I race exactly the wheels I train with, and Envy wheels and components can take everything you throw at them, and that for sure goes uh, double in the Leadville 100. Check them out at enve.com. Once again, big thanks to all our sponsors uh, this season for our Leadville Trail 100 podcast presented by Floyd's of Leadville. And now let's welcome our guest, Joe Stein, one of the two sweep riders for this year's LT100. Joe, thanks for being on the show. My pleasure. Glad glad to be on. Uh, Joe, I, I have so many questions for you, but let's start with some basics. First of all, have you ever raced the Leadville 100 before? Yes, I actually uh, raced it twice, the first time in 2012, mm -hmm. and then more recently in 2017. Um, and I actually did this year the stage race a few weeks before Leadville. So that was a great experience, too. I hadn't done that before. And, All right. So uh, yeah. how did you get the job of sweeper uh, uh, for the Leadville 100? How were you picked for that? Are you an EMT, really good at holding a steady pace? I, I'm really interested in the how you got into this into this situation. Well, it's a, a little bit of a story, but I was uh, trying to qualify uh, for next year because I turned 60, so I want to make next year a big deal with my 60th birthday. And mm -hmm. I did the Tahoe Trail Race. I uh, didn't get a coin there, and so I thought I'd do uh, Leadville. Uh, stage race. And uh, there's a lot of coins that are given out during that race. But sure. uh, unfortunately, didn't get one there either. One of my buddies, Paul, actually volunteered there at the stage race as a sweep. And that's where I got the idea. If, you know, I'm going to do some volunteer hours to try to get in next year. Why not get a workout in too? And uh, <laughs> uh, so I actually I contacted Rich, the, the race director there. And um, you know, volunteered my name. Paul had done a great job um, at the stage race, and so he was excited to have me uh, uh, to be the sweep for the the, the hundred miler. And um, you know, he asked me a few questions about you know my experience. I did a nine hour, ten minute in 2017, so you know, reasonable time. And yeah. um, um, so he uh, he uh, was happy to have me come on board, and then. I volunteered my best friend Graham to be the secondary sweep because logistically, which we'll probably get into, I couldn't really sweep the entire hundred mile course. So no, so, no, you so couldn't. That's, so that's how I got in there. Yeah, that's still it's a big job for two people, right? I mean, I, I figured when I, once I heard sweepers, I thought, well, they must have like twenty of them out there, but just the two of you covering one hundred and three miles. Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it was, uh, and uh, it was a little bit uh, more than I thought it would be, just from a total. Uh, endurance standpoint uh, i thought it would be a nice easy day you know leisurely ride most of the time since you know i'm following the last rider in the course but it didn't quite turn out to be that way so how did you guys divide the work i mean who did you get a section and he got a section or how does that work yeah so the way the cutoffs work is you know as, as you probably know well you don't have to worry about it but um at twin lakes the cutoff is four hours so um we knew that the last rider was going to be coming in much later than that so if uh, Rich wanted someone sweeping someone up Columbine, you needed a second person because they had to be at Twin Lakes at four hours. I ended mm -hmm. up coming into Twin Lakes around five and a half to six hours. So that's you know a good hour and a half where somebody's already been starting up Columbine. So it made sense that I would do the first 40 miles and then Graham would get to Twin Lakes. He actually rode the first 40 miles and got into Twin Lakes before for the four hour cutoff. So he could follow that last rider up Columbine. And then when I got into Twin Lakes, uh, Twin Lakes, I'd get a little bit of a break until the next cutoff, which was, I believe, seven hours, 45 minutes coming back. So I got a little break and then I'd follow that last person back in. So that's sort of how we uh, structured it. 
Yeah. So the the work is divided between downtown Leadville and Twin Lakes and then Twin Lakes to Columbine. Those are the two yeah. kind of the two territories that are worked out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And how did you, did you guys draw straws or how did you work that out? <laughs> well, well, since I was the uh, primary person trying to get the volunteer hours, I took the uh, lion's share of the route and then Graham was nice enough to come with me and, and, and do the secondary sweep. We had a, a few friends uh, riding the race. So it was fun to go out there and we thought we'd, you know, spend some time with them too and see them out there. Oh, that's fantastic. So let's, let's back all the way up to the starting line. Sure. And where where did you where do you situate yourself as the race sweeper and what is um and, and then sort of take us and take us through your day yeah so we got up uh, along with with the other racers we actually stayed at a friend's place who was racing in in Leadville so we didn't have to drive in and we got up and um positioned ourselves right at the intersection of 6th Street and what's the main drag called? I should know. Harrison. Harrison. Yeah, yep. thank you. And uh, mm-hmm. right there, just outside of the corrals, so we can watch all the corral riders go by and then just latch on, um, you know, after the last rider went by. So that's that's where we stationed ourselves. Mm-hmm. And um, when when the race started off, it was, <laughs> it was amazing because I forget how many riders there are. So it took you know, quite a bit of time for all the uh, corrals to to go by us. And then as soon as the last rider went, we, um, you know, we were sort of with us next to the spectators, if you will, on on Harrison there. So we just went right into the course and then started following the riders down. Um, Oh, so you didn't, you didn't roll through the starting line. You rolled after the starting line. um, No, we actually rolled, the starting line is, yeah, we rolled through the starting line because we were on Harrison and sixth. So all so right. we, we actually did roll through the starting line. And actually, when we got right to the starting line, I looked around, and that was the first issue we had. I saw a rider with a race plate just sitting next to his bike or standing next to his bike. So <laughs> I was like, okay, I was I was prepared for a nice leisurely ride following the last rider down. But then there's this guy who's supposed to be racing just standing there. So the gun's fired, everyone's rolled away, and there's someone who is not left. What's going on? What's happening? <laughs> exactly my thought. So I, I go up to him. I go, what's going on? He, he, he was a little frantic looking. Uh, he goes, my wife has my camel back. Uh, oh, no. Oh, and uh, the thought's going through my head. I said, why would you do that? But um, anyway, uh, he's looking around. He can't find her. Uh, and I, I had I've had I, this nightmare. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so I had the bright idea, let's get the race announcer to call her name. So I went over to the race announcer and he's, I can't remember what her name was, but he's calling her two or three times. Finally, probably three or four minutes, she comes running up. I have no idea where she was, but she came running up. She grabbed it, strapped it on, gave her a kiss, and then he took off like a rocket. That uh, was pretty funny. Um, so I, I I wonder if he if he had the presence of mind to not roll across the start mat so that they, uh, he still got a, a a good chip time. You know I think he was past the start. start He'd mat. gone across. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure, so but it, I think he might have been. That's <laughs> that sort of sucks. <laughs> um, uh, he, so the okay, clock was so, ticking on him while he's while he's waiting for his camel back. Now before we get go down, uh, go down Sixth Street with you here, Joe. First of all, how does the race equip you? Do you have you have a radio or something? Oh. And and what's your setup like? Did you did you good. set up your bike ready for race, or how did you set yourself good, up? Good good question. So I had um, a, a plate that said sweep on it, and um, I had a race radio with an extra battery, uh, so I could. My role was to make sure that uh, anybody who's dropping. Uh, I would take the little uh, tag, tracking tag off the back of their race plate and then call their number in to the uh, central station, wherever whoever I was calling into uh, was on the other side of the race radio. So they could always know where everybody was. So um, the, there was no, supposed to be no one behind me that they, did, they weren't aware of. So um, that was a, mm-hmm. really, really a safety thing because they wanted to make sure nobody got lost on the course or had an issue that mm-hmm. they weren't aware of. So I had a race radio. And then I brought, um, unlike race day, I brought my mule. And I had, you know, I just brought a first aid kit. I had extra uh, CO2 cartridges. I actually went to the 
got a Cuban sandwich and had that in because I thought I'd have some leisurely time to eat. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just a lot of extra stuff in my, my meal that I normally wouldn't bring on, a, on, a, on race day. So that was sort of my setup. Uh-huh. Yeah. I well, love you that you were, brought a big sandwich. <laughs> did you have a crew or anything? What was your support? Did you have any type of crew set up or were you just relying on the on the race? Yeah, I was, race itself? I was just re- relying on the aid stations that, that we were going to be going oh, okay. through. Yeah. So. All right. Yeah. So, so unexpectedly, you are, I mean, you are the last person, of course, at, intentionally, but you are th- a few minutes behind the last person it, it, right off the gun and yes. or yes. I, I guess or did you ride along with the guy who had the uh you know the missing camel back for a few minutes and i imagine that he caught up and and started passing because he was probably riding with serious adrenaline yeah he looks like he was in pretty a pretty good rider so he was he was gone mm. um you know i i was going reasonable pace but i was trying not to to burn myself out because i knew i'd have a long day and i right. have to mention that um, I told Graham, my my buddy, go ahead, don't wait for me here at the start because he had to get to Twin Lakes before the four hour cutoff. So, right. So he took off too. So I was all by myself. Um, but it gets worse because I went up Sixth Street and turned right on the road, and I'm coming around, probably less than a mile into the race, and there's a woman uh, with a race number uh, on the side of the road, and oh, and no. uh, so I stop. Um, and I immediately noticed it was very strange. She didn't look like she had a, like the typical race kit on, and her bike was not at all a high end bike that you'd normally expect in this race, um, almost like a hybrid bike. And and I said, "Are you are you okay?" She and she said, "Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm just going to drop from the race." I go. So she was still on the downhill part of the pavement, yeah. and yeah. I, I, do you have any idea what the story was with that? No, and that's one of the, my big regrets of the day is I was so intent about, <laughs> okay, now I'm getting really behind and I need to catch up that I just, you know, got her, her race num- uh, race tag off, uh, called it in, and then I took off again. Um, but I wish I would have actually spent a minute and <laughs> understand what, what the story was. I, you know, I have a lot of different ideas, but who, I don't know. It's very interesting. Any theories on that, Hottie? Hmm. In over her head and realized it right away. Yeah. Didn't have a flat. I, I, we know that. Didn't no, drop a chain. Nope. No, no back right. issues. I, I, I'm just wondering if she had, if she, yeah, either over her head or perhaps um, was somehow a, a friend who couldn't get uh, get in the race or somehow did get in the race but wasn't able to come. She was riding with someone else's race plate. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, that could oh. be. Oh. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? I guess we'll never know. But okay. So you are, you've now, been in the race for less than a mile and have uh had two pretty unusual experiences (laughs) let's let's uh let's continue on down the path are are you uh when did you come across the next uh the next last rider yeah so um yeah so at that point i'm like oh i gotta catch up so i'm going at what probably would be my normal leadville race pace um and which at the start of the race you know i'm huffing and puffing like crazy um, get through the... And did you have any expectation that would ever be, I mean, the, the way that you'd be riding, that you're go, having these, you know, slow stop and then, you know, just having to go all out to catch the back of the race? It, I, I actually uh, underestimated that completely and it, it happened more than once. <laughs> um, but especially at the start, I didn't think that would be happening actually at all for quite a while. So, so that was definitely a surprise. Um, yeah, so I, I went through the, you know, the, the fire, the dirt road until you actually do the physical climb up St. Kevin's and, um, started up mm-hmm. there. Um, and about maybe a quarter of the way up, it took till I actually saw the first, the next last rider, if you will, um, in front of me, it was a woman and she was walking up that section. Usually where when I'm riding, there's a conga line of riders, you know, in the back half of the race going up this section. Um, and she was walking up there all alone. Um, I, I, as I caught up to her, there was actually another rider, probably about 200 yards ahead of her walking. So those were the two I, I saw. But I, I actually introduced, mm-hmm. introduced myself, and I was trying to be – I didn't know how to quite approach it. I said I was going to be her escort as long as she needs me. And, um, you know, got to know her because, you know, we were walking, and she'd stop from time to time too. Um 
very nice woman. She was from uh, the New York area, Brooklyn, I believe. And mm-hmm. she, she, mm-hmm. oh, so yeah. so the altitude was definitely affecting her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She said she got in through the lottery, um, and for the, mm-hmm. her, this was a bucket, bucket list race. Um, and we were talking about her training, and she did a lot of road riding, but there's not a lot of hills where she is, so she had a hard time with trying to find hills to ride, which I think played into where she was in the race. Um, but she was serious. I mean, she hired a coach. She she got in great shape, she said, and she came out probably 11 days early. So it sounded like she had a good plan for acclimating. But mm-hmm. um, she was definitely concerned about the climbs, and uh, they were hard for her. Every, about a 3%, 4% grade, anything above that, we were we were walking pretty much, so... And that's the fair amount of St. Keith, right. as, as you can imagine. Brooklyn is a long way from Leadville, is it not? I mean, it's, you know. <laughs> yeah. Right, Joe, yeah. T- before we move on, what's your training ground like? I mean, how physically prepared were you for this event? Well, I, I actually, this uh, this year, since I wasn't doing the actual Leadville race, I was in semi-good shape, I would say. You know, I did the Tahoe, which was pretty grueling. I wasn't quite in a what I'd call Leadville shape. Um, but you know, I'd done some, uh, we have a good group of guys here who were going to Leadville. So we have a ride we call the pain train, which is on, on the mm-hmm. weekend, uh, uh, the long days they'll do, uh, nine hours and nine to 10,000 mm-hmm. feet. So, um, uh, those are the long, long workouts on the weekends. We do a few of those, Ouch. but, um, mm-hmm. during the week, a little bit shorter, usually two to three hour rides. So. All right, so take us back to Brooklyn. How does this resolve itself, or does it? Well, yeah, so we um, went up St. Kevin's walking, and, and I, I when she walked, I walked. I thought that was just the right thing to do because I didn't want to demoralize her by, you know, doing slow pedaling. So I walked Absolutely, every time. Absolutely, yeah. You want to encourage her. Yeah. I mean, it's- yeah. So, it, you know, we, we talked quite a bit, and, uh, you know, when we got up to Carter Summit aid station, it was probably about an hour 45 into the race, mm-hmm. and, you know, she was – already thinking about, uh, you know, it's not good. She's not going to make the cutoff. And she was wondering whether she should, you know, drop at that point. Cause that's one of the points where you could figure out how to get back. Um, right. And, and I did let her know, I said, based on, you know, my experience and her pace, she was probably into twin lakes in five to six hours. But, but I did tell her if she wanted to continue, I'm there you know, to support her. Cause that's my, my job for the day. Um, and this is one of the funniest things that happened. We were sitting there talking and uh, these spectators came up and this, this woman asked, you know, is she in the race? And she said, yes, but she was thinking about dropping out. And the woman got, s- the spectator got so in- excited, said, you can't drop. You got to keep going. You got to keep going until they pull you. Uh, this woman was uh, up there for the trail run. And I guess she told us it was her fourth time up there and she had, hadn't yet completed it. But she she never dropped until she was pulled out of the race. So, mm-hmm. so that actually sort of uh, changed uh, my rider's mind, and she decided, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna continue. So um, uh, I I sort of let her know, okay, let's go down the asphalt, and then you know over to Hagman's, the dirt part, and then yep. you know right where it sort of U turns and starts getting steep. Mm-hmm. I said, let's stop there, and then we'll regroup there and make you know decide whether you want to go forward based on that. So, so we decided to do that. So we kept going. And this is—is is this what the race director tells you to do to find the last person out there mm-hmm. and stick with them? Are those your direct instructions? Yes. So um, I'm always with the last person, whoever that is. So it's possible we could have caught up to somebody else, and then you know she goes on, and I have sure. a new last person. But I had—I was be with her for a fair amount of that first part from St. Kevin's all the way to to the part I mentioned. And I do have to mention, I'm right. not always alone because they have a great group of roving ATV search and rescue guys out there. And um, like going up St. Kevin's, uh, from time to time, there was three ATVs that would come up on me. Uh, one of them had a physician's assist- assistant, a PA, and uh, the other yeah. two were just uh, search and rescue guys. So they were roving the course, um, going where needed. Um, which did come into play a little late, later in the race for me. Um, so they were out there too. So that was sort of nice to ha- know they were around. Yeah, it's great to know there's medical help out there. So uh, yeah, and, it, and if I saw anything, I could just call on my race radio saying, hey, I need need these guys. So mm-hmm. yeah. 
Yeah. Excellent. So you you get to the the turn off the pavement onto Hagerman's and mm-hmm. um and you 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 agreed that you're going to reassess. What happens when you did this reassessment? Yeah. So we got it took about another hour, I'd say, to get to that point I talked about where you yeah. Really there's some the, climbing the cl- there. Yeah. yeah, and you know we got far enough where she could see. Oh, it gets pretty darn rocky and steep, and there's a lot more walking here. And uh, she oh, decided, the sugarloaf climb. Okay. Yes. So, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, not the wide paved road. That 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 part we went through, but the the sugarloaf mm-hmm. climb. Yeah, and and at that point she made the tough decision to to drop. You know, and and it was it was tough for her. I was, I always felt sort of sad. I. I, I mentioned, you know, how Ken said that the race can change your life. And, you know, I, I told her I thought that was true for her because she had she lost a lot of weight. She she'd come, had this adventure and she'd got this far. And and, um, you know, she was pretty bummed. But, you know, we hugged and I pulled her tag and and called her in and, and sort of gave her directions to get, get back down. Um, so, yeah, it was it was, it was pretty interesting. And now what yeah, for I mean, you? Now you got to climb Sugarloaf like crazy or what happens now? <laughs> that's a, that's yeah, exactly how, right. How far back are you from the new last writer? Yeah. I, I had no idea time-wise how far back I was. Um, that guy I had mm-hmm. seen 200 yards ahead of us when I first caught up to this woman was long gone. And um, uh, so I had no idea. So um, I just took off. I got a little smarter. I didn't tr- try to kill myself this time. But, um, you know, I was climbing Sugarloaf, most of Sugarloaf by myself. So it was a good climb. I was working pretty hard. Um, yeah. And uh, actually, as I was climbing, uh, the ATVs came up to me and said, uh, hey, we have a broken ankle up ahead that we got to get to. So I, I moved over so they could, you know, go up there and, and, and get that guy. And I was still climbing, uh, getting towards a little higher up when they came back down with that guy and he was in the back of one of the ATVs. <laughs> it was tough. He was actually uh, clenching his glove in his mouth because the jost- oh. jostling, I think, was causing so much pain, as you can imagine, as, oh, he, was, as he was going, poor guy. Down, going down. Yeah, that sort of sucked. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many stories that happen uh, no matter where you are in this race. And yeah, you, you really got to see, I mean, a, a lot of people's uh, uh, personal drama, as, you know, as, whether it was a great day or, you know, a, a strange day or, you know, a, a transformational day. So it's, uh, I, I'm imagining you you booked it up. Uh, did you catch anyone before you started coming down uh, power line or were you still alone? Yeah, I, I did. I- I did catch a rider about two thirds of the way up Sugarloaf, mm-hmm. and he was he was uh, walking, um, uh, but riding very slowly up most of it. Um, and we got to the top, and and when we got to the top, he started going down, and he was actually pretty fast on the downhill. So um, I was having a pretty fun time following him on the downhill uh, until uh, a couple appeared in front of me who were going very slow. So that was my next last rider, if you will, that mm-hmm. I caught up with was this couple from Pennsylvania. So, so on tandem uh, or? Just, no, no, just two, two individuals. Two yeah. Okay. So were they, were they yeah. together then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, they were, they were, I, I don't know if they were husband and wife or boyfriend, girlfriend, or just friends. Right. But um, as I found out um, that the woman uh, was, did not like downhills at all. Oh. So she was really really going slowly picking her way through the rocks and, and you know, the, the, the bumps and the ruts. Um, and, uh, as I was talking to them, I said, you know, Hey, I'm here to hang with you. And, and I think Mike, the guy, the guy said, no, no, he's super experienced. He was supporting her because mm-hmm. it was her first Leadville. So he said, you know, I, I can hang with her. You can go ahead. Uh, and he looked like he knew what he was talking about. He pretty experienced, um, and they said they were going to drop at pipeline. Um, so I decided to go ahead. I just called in their numbers to let them know they were coming. Um, but I didn't pull their tags since I'd let them, you know, do that at pipeline. Right. So those are the only ones I really didn't, I, uh, didn't stay with, um, because, you know, he seemed like it was pretty experienced. Mm -hmm. So, so that allowed me to actually have a fun, uh, fun rest of the way down, down power line, which was fun. Uh, I hadn't done the new gravel section before. Yeah, are you so feeling like pretty... you're getting away with something doing this? That you, your volunteer uh, hours getting you into next year's Leadville is racing or well, riding. 
the Leadville 100. <laughs> it's pretty great. It, it is. It is. It's a lot of fun. But uh, as as you'll as you'll hear through the end of the day, it's a lot, a lot of work too. Oh, yeah. So it may not it may not be for everybody, but that's for, for sure. But for for me, it was it was actually rewarding in a, in a number of ways. But um, yeah. Yeah, and that's actually near the end of the power line is where I came up on the, the next last rider, this gentleman who, uh, almost like in the bottom where you, you have that f- sharp right-hand turn, it's a little bit sketchy at the bottom of that new paved er- or that new graded area. Yeah, is yeah, it's I a hard came, ride. Came up on him, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that guy I was actually with for a while then because um, we rode basically the pavement together, um, went through the pipeline aid station. Um, and as we're getting, uh, nearing the end of pipeline, when we actually, the leaders started coming back, we're like, Holy my gosh. Hmm. Um, and so how, how, I don't know what you, time re- are yes. you into the race at this point? Do you know? I think I am. I don't know the exact time, but I'm guessing I'm at least four hours plus Okay. in, in already. I don't know if that makes sense from, uh, when these guys would be coming back. Yeah. If you, are you at the single track yet or before there? Before the single track. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably looking at four hours then right in there. Cause the pros yeah. can get up to the top and back to this and finish the single track and oh, easily four hours. They can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're yeah. finishing in, or they're finishing the whole race in about six hours. So they're yeah. two thirds of the way through the race. Yeah. They're it, it, in six or I'm sorry, four hours. Um, yeah. They're, they're closing in on uh, pipeline inbound. Yeah. That's it's a, astonishing. That's- that is, it was amazing to see those guys flying. It was, it was sort of cool. Um, uh, there was some big puddles in that section. I don't know if you remember, but um, sure. It seemed like every time we came to the puddle, one of the one of the racers, the this the uh, the lead guys was coming the other way. So we'd actually have to stop because we didn't wasn't sure we weren't sure which way they wanted to come across around the puddle. So we'd let let them have the right of way. So that not that it mattered, but it slowed us down a little bit more. Um, Hmm. as we're going through that section yeah but well, it's I, cool that you're that you're taking care of the of the you know the the pros up uh, up at the front of the race as well as the the riders uh toward the backs uh, yeah it's very yeah. nice of you yeah and and here's something that's interesting that i did not know is that um i wasn't sure it was one of the first questions i asked at our sweep orientation if you will of rich I said what are we going to do at the single track and mm-hmm. so what they do is um, they actually have a reroute. So when the lead racers hit Twin Lakes, there are some race personnel stationed at right before the single track starts. I don't. There's this steep little thirty yard downhill. I don't know what that's called. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? That that yep. I think they used to call it Collarbone Hill. Yeah, or clavicle, clavicle Hill. Or yeah. Hill. Or yeah. <laughs> so right at the top of that. We don't go down that. We actually continue along that ridge line and then hit a fire road that takes us down to the main road down there. To, oh. So that's how they. Okay. Yeah. I know exactly where you're talking about. Because they pretty much know anybody who is there as the pros are already coming back out of the Twin Lakes Dam. Those people who are still outbound are not going to make the cutoff, but they're giving them a chance to at least get to Twin Lakes, get to the the timing mat at the Twin Lakes exactly. Dam. Exactly. That sounds like the strategy. Exactly. Right. And I thought that was a very smart thing to do. So, yeah. So I don't know how many uh, of the riders in front of me had taken that route because I was just with the very last one. But when we got there, um, you know, mm-hmm. we, that's the route we took and went down there. And, and then um, basically where the single track ends at that road you turn right on, that's where we rejoined the, the, the regular course, if you will. So. Uh, All right. Now. Uh, and as you're on, once you rejoin on the regular course, and that's a, a part where you're on pavement and then, you know, the wide dirt road for a while as you're working your way up toward mm-hmm. uh, Twin Lakes Dam uh, outbound. And you can see quite a ways there. Are you able to see quite a few riders or is it strung out pretty far? I'm kind of trying to get a picture of what, you know, what what it's looking like from uh from your vantage point yeah so from my vantage point we actually caught up to another rider so at mm-hmm. that point i was sort of escorting two and they would be sort of going back and forth a little bit so oh, cool. you know this one guy would get ahead so i'd drop behind you know this rider and then the other one would get ahead so i'd be switching off a fair amount on that last section um and be, in front of me i probably saw 
two to three other riders. So there's about five right. within my line of sight. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. That, and, that and so the folks, the the couple of people that you are riding with, are you talking mm-hmm. with them, encouraging them, just sort of keeping a respectful distance and letting them, you know, spend their time in the pain cave? Just how how do you read a person and and what they what they need or don't want from uh, from you at that point in the race? Because you know they're you know. Some people might really enjoy having someone, you know, having company. Some people, you know, just need to suffer through it themselves. I've been both those yeah. people. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that's a good point. You almost, I felt like I had to sort of gauge each person individually. I, the first thing I would say is, hey, I'm here if you need anything. So I would mm-hmm. open it up with that. And then I'd ask if they're okay. And, you know, usually it's yes, or I'm having a tough day or something along that lines. And then I would just hang sort of near them within usually 10, 15 feet. I'd come up to them every once in a while. And the ones that wanted to talk, I would let them start the conversation and then I would join in. Sure. But I wouldn't, tr- I wouldn't try to do it just because I'm respectful of what you said. There are people who just want to be in their cave because they're just trying to, you know, push through it. And and I don't want to disrupt that if if they're in that mode. So, um, and, and I ran into both sorts, you know, the woman I described, the first woman I came up to, she actually enjoyed talking. We had great conversations that didn't happen all the time with all the writers. So that's a, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not a lot of air for talk, for conversation <laughs> in the late no, 100. No, you know, sometimes they would be, have to stop and just catch their breath, you know? So, you know, sure. during those times we might have a little bit of a conversation. So, Yeah. Yeah. All right, so you're getting pretty close to Twin Lakes where you're going to be handing the uh, the sweet baton, I guess you could say, to to your friend Graham. Uh, about what time are you getting into, uh, into Twin Lakes uh, outbound? Yeah, so we were coming into Twin Lakes right around five and a half hours at this point. And mm-hmm. um, as you know— and So you, the, the cutoff has already begun, oh, it's, right? Because don't they start cut— It was four, four hours, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, and and the the cutoff has begun an hour and a half. Anyone, they, they've been cutting off people for a while. Oh yeah. And I assume your friend Graham, he's taken off as well. Yeah, he would, already before you get there. He was long gone, and you know, with a race radio, yeah. it's sort of nice because you can hear everything going on. And I, I do have to take a second and say, what an incredible job these folks do putting lifetime and rich and these guys do putting on this race because there are right. so many issues they have to deal with. So. Uh, so you can hear everything going on. And in fact, I already heard a couple of times he called him, he called himself race sweep too, um, mentioning, oh, I had to pull a tag here or I had this, you know, so he, I've already heard him a couple of times in that hour and a half since he took off, uh, dealing with things on his part of the route. So, yeah. Um, and, and what else came crackling across that radio? I imagine some pretty interesting things. Oh, it started with, there was a truck locked on the course somewhere right in the way of the racers and oh no and i i heard one of the guys a- asking for authorization to break the window so they could move the truck and i i don't know exactly what happened um there was a possible fire out by box canyon i don't know where that is that they had to have someone investigate um hmm. the trailer they use at the very top of columbine had a flat so i don't know how they were dealing Ooh. with i mean all kinds of things popped up in, in, yeah. including you know injuries that you know they sent the atvs out after so fatty next time i go to leadville remind me to bring a scanner because i want to listen to that stuff and yeah, no it. kidding i'm suddenly <laughs> thinking man that is you know we're all we're all having a race but there is a lot going on that we do not know about well, by, uh, Joe, while we're on the topic of what came came across the radio, did you ever see or hear anything about tax? There was some, you know, a lot of complaints about tax on the course this year. Mm-hmm. Again, did, did any of that cross your path? I did not hear anything about it uh, on the race radio, um, but it could be there was, you know, there's so much noise going through there. It, it might have been mentioned and I just didn't pick it up. Yeah. So, and then um, you never saw anybody pulled over either and never saw them on the course yourself. Uh, there was a few flats I came across. Um, let's see, where was that? There was a guy on power line who had, was dealing with the second flat. Mm. Um, and I don't know if that was a tag issue or not, but he actually was mm. dropping. So, um, I had pulled his tag and called it in. Mm. So, um, okay. I kept going at that time. Yeah. But I, I don't, I, I didn't hear a lot about that, although I understand it was a big issue during that race. 
So you pull into Columbine, and is there any chance for you to rest and recover, or are you, what, or what happens? into Twin Lakes, yeah. Or in Twin Lakes, I'm sorry, Twin Lakes, yeah. Yeah, well, so actually an interesting thing. So coming into Twin Lakes, there was a couple sort of tricky areas. One is that little six-foot drop down into the support station. Mm -hmm. uh, and all these riders are coming up it. So we're like, oh, stop saying, yeah. oh my gosh. Yeah, and I had the two guys there and I said, how are we going to get down that? So I said, okay, um, look for, as soon as you see a bit of a break, because you could see other riders coming up, you got to go down it sort of quick. And so we had to time that, which took two or three minutes. And then past that main initial crew support area, there's a, a single track before you get to the dam. Right. And we couldn't ride that because it was a constant stream of riders. So oh, yeah. I actually... Actually instructed the guy, we basically had to bushwhack. We had to go through the weeds on the right side of that single track to to get to get to the finish line because it was there was just too many riders coming through. Mm -hmm. So and even across the dam, we actually rode in the area where the spectators are because once again the riders were coming through on the on the, on the, <laughs> sure. on the, main, on the main trail. So we sort of had to just figure that thing out a little bit towards the very end there. So that was a little interesting. And so, meanwhile, and, you know, or I guess flashing forward uh, in distance, but flashing back a little bit in time, your friend Graham has taken off at at, at hour four yeah. from uh, with the new last rider. Yep. But how can he? T it's I mean, so, I'm kind of picturing you've got a timing mat, and then you've got a million people, mm -hmm. and you've got, you know, people who are crossing the timing mat and then going and hanging out with their crews and getting food and water or, or what have you before they take off. How can he even tell who the new last rider is? Well, he actually ran into an issue there that he didn't anticipate because, you know, the last rider who made the cutoff, he started following him. And he didn't get mm -hmm. very far until he got passed by somebody. And so he, he goes to that person going, well, where are you coming from? Are, and he, are you still in the race? And, he, and the guy says, yeah, I was just with my support crew. And then the light bulb yeah. went on and he goes, oh my gosh, I don't know how many other people are who made the cutoff, but just are hanging out there for a little time regrouping. Sure. So, yeah. so he Am sort I of the stopped. the last writer or not? Yeah. yeah. So he stopped and there was like, like, I don't know how many, but he said a fair amount of riders came by. Um, and he kept asking them, you know, are you in the race? Are you in the race? And um, finally, you know, there was one last guy and, and it didn't seem like anybody else was coming. So he decided, well, that's probably the last person. He never knew for sure, but it turned out it probably it was. <laughs> OK. So, yeah, that, that's that actually uh, you know, is something we didn't totally didn't anticipate. So that's a good question. Again, he probably had some amount of commotion at alternate feed as well, Fatty. I mean, you've got oh, people sure. pulling over there and are they last or are they, who knows what's going on there. Well, it's a real so busy you, area. Yeah. It, it would be I mean, hard whole... to tell where you are in terms of, uh, in, in terms of uh, the, in, in terms of being the final person, the person mm -hmm. who is making sure that uh, there's no one behind who is getting lost or having having injury or or illness or anything else, you know, things that happen. Yeah. Uh, for sure, you know, everywhere in the race, and you don't want to have someone back there without you know without help. So yeah. it's, that's tricky. So uh, how long how long was Graham? Uh, with uh i guess once he identified who the who the uh last person up to columbine was how long was he with him or her he actually was with that person it was a guy from puerto rico i believe which oh, cool. is uh was sort of cool and um yeah he said they actually um walked quite a, a bit even some of the bottom section before you get to the goat trail they mm -hmm. were they were walking some of that section so um, he knew pretty quickly that, you know, there, he wasn't go going to make the, the seven and a half cutoff back down at Twin Lakes. Um, and there was a point in time, I think, right when they hit the goat trail, he, he said, hey, you know, I can tell you, you know, we're, we're not going to make it back down in time. Do you want to keep going? And the guy said, you know what? I'm going to go. I, you know, I, I'm determined to make it to the top. So Graham said, great. That's I admire that. Forward. That is so. Yeah, I, I think that's amazing. He came from Puerto Rico. He, you know, he, he wasn't going to pull out until he, until he had to. And there is yeah. no cut. There is no cutoff time at Colum at the uh, Columbine Summit. So yeah, it, it, yeah. So uh, yeah, when they got to the Columbine Summit, they uh, 
had the aid station almost packed up. Mm -hmm. Um, but they still were there and, uh, they gave him good support. Um, you know, they got, got everything out that the guy needed and, and Graham too. And, um, but they didn't make it down till almost, I think nine hours into the race. Right. So, so that's probably an hour yeah. and a half after, after the cutoff Oof. there. So it was, a uh, even though he only went 20 miles, that was still a long time that he, uh, he was up there. Well, I thought Graham started at the beginning of the race, didn't he? So he did yeah, 60 he did. miles all, all told. Yeah. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. actually more than that, he, he initially thought, hey, I'll get back down and then I'll catch up to you. Mm -hmm. That was his initial <laughs> plan. Yeah. That, <laughs> but you're <laughs> gone. Plans. Yeah. But I, I was gone an hour and a half into it. So he decided yeah. uh, that probably wasn't going to work. So That'd be quite a chase by Graham. Yeah. He could pull that off. <laughs> So yes, what did you do at Twin Lakes? Did you did you just hang out for a while, and, and then you had to, at some point had to figure out who the last person they were going to let through was, right? Yeah. So I, I actually hung out there. I relaxed. They had a chair I could use. I um, I um, actually I had a, a good good buddy in the race, so I went over to uh, his support crew and waited till he came through and cheered him on. And he was over mm -hmm. on the other side of the dam. Um, and then I did a little riding around because I didn't want to completely. Um, completely uh cool down so i, I did some yeah, freeze up very yeah. easy riding and uh until that seven uh seven and a half hour mark or 745 mark i can't remember what it was 745 i believe 745 into right. the race and um so i was waiting until that clock ticked off and the last rider had gone by maybe three or four minutes earlier but i had to wait mm -hmm. in case some anybody else came through so sure. um when they had announced the official cutoff I, I once again i started off um uh, across the dam and almost like the first times right after i crossed the dam uh and i hit that support area there, i noticed a woman on the side of the road uh, who had an ice pack on her shoulder and i remembered her because i was hanging around the um the uh the medic area and she had come in uh seeking support because she had crashed coming down columbine Ooh. um and, but then she had taken off and I thought she continued on. So I stopped. I said, Oh, how are you doing? She goes, Oh, not very good. Um, I said, are you going to continue on? And she said, no, I'm going to have to drop here, but I got my support crew. Um, and I talked to her for a second and she was so bummed because last year she finished the race in 12 hours and like one minute. So she missed oh. the belt buckle by a minute, I think last year. And then this year she was actually doing great. She was ahead of her time until she crashed. So she was she was pretty bummed that she wasn't going to mm -hmm. be able to finish. Oh yeah. And, well, uh, anyone who's ever seen the uh, the uh, race across the sky uh, movies, uh, the the scenes from uh, you know, from the folks who either crash or get pulled. Those are those are heartbreaking in, in a way. You, I mean, that was kind of that was your vantage point for the whole day. I mean, that would be, I mean, you made some friends, you saw some great people, but you also saw a lot of heartbreak. Is oh, kind yeah. of is yeah. kind of the the uh, the big takeaway here. Yes, that, uh, you saw people who were not having the day they had hoped for. Absolutely, it was uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like I said, a rewarding, a sad day. Uh, definitely, uh, definitely a unique experience for sure. Um, so for her, I had to pull her tag again, uh, radio it in, mm -hmm. and then once again, take off, not knowing how far, far now behind I was. So, uh, um, so I actually, uh, felt pretty good at that point cause I had, had a good rest and, uh, you know, was got pretty fast going up that paved road out of Twin Lakes. Um, right. And right at the top there is when I caught the next last rider, uh, right where it turns from paved to dirt. And, mm -hmm. and she was moving pretty good. Um, and uh, she, she asked me what the cutoff was at Pipeline. I told her I think it was 3.15 p.m. Um, and at that time, I looked at my watch. It was around 2.30. Um, and I think she was doing mental math in her head. Because uh, she started all, all of a sudden, she started picking up the pace. <laughs> and uh, soon she passed another rider. So, uh, mm -hmm. so in that section from uh, Twin Lakes all the way to Pipeline – there was actually quite a few riders in play there. Uh, it was different riders kept passing other riders. Some were better on the, you know, the, there's little downs and ups there that aren't that little mm -hmm. when you're that far into the race. Um, and so the lead, not the lead, the last rider kept changing uh, between probably four or five people during that section. So um, it's right. pretty interesting. Well, yeah, people who 
or who are making a, 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 a really concerted effort, and they they still have hopes and dreams of crossing that finish line, whether at 12 hours or 13 hours or, or any time, right? So, yeah, they're, these people are absolutely giving their all, yeah. right? And, and that is the place where it's kind of the, I guess, the tipping point on that seesaw of whether they're going to make it or, 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 or at least have a chance to keep trying to make it, to get up uh, power line. But, and, and that kind of, that brings a question that, you know, as I sort of imagine, you know, your little blue dot mm-hmm. on the on mm-hmm. the map and the and the imaginary red line of the of the cutoff. Of course, you are well it, it, there. You're staying back with the mm-hmm. last people. And meanwhile, the cutoff is happening at, you say, sev- uh, what time in the at, at power line at 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 at. I'm sorry, at, at Pipeline? At Pipeline, it's 3.15 p.m., yeah. Right. And so you're going to get to Pipeline well after that because you're with the final person. And right. that means right. the new place you need to be is well ahead of where you are. Um, right, and right. Kind of, so <laughs> what happens then? Well, so I, I actually got into Pipeline, I remember this, right at 3.32 because, you know, I was hoping these mm-hmm. folks would make it and, you know, some of them were trying very hard, but... Um, obviously the riders I could see in my, uh, ahead of me, including the one I was with didn't, unfortunately didn't make that cut off. And we got there and, you know, uh, obviously it had been cut off for what, 17 minutes, I guess. Um, yeah. and p- that's some of the riders who were cut off were milling around, talking to each other, talking to the volunteers and, you know, the vol- volunteers were really great at giving them support in both food and drink and helping them figuring out how to get back back home, uh, calling rides and such. Um, so I was at that point, like I said, 17 minutes behind the last person who had left. So I really hurried, filled my bottles, uh, gave the tags I had accumulated, uh, to the head of the pipeline support crew, uh, and then grabbed some food and and took off, um, to try to catch, catch up to that next person. Yeah. So that was another point where I had to ride pretty, pretty hard. And then how long did it take to to find the next the next last. Well, it took a little while because on the way out, once I hit the paved road, there was a couple people stopped on the side of the roads with uh, next to cars and they had race plates on. So I had to stop to see if they had dropped from the race. But it turns out they tags had been pulled at pipeline and they were just getting, you know, getting their yeah. uh, support crew to take them home. But I, that took me a little bit of time because I had to stop. And oh, at that time, I realized I looked down. I had left my water bottles at pipeline. I forgot to put them back on my bike. Oh no. Oh yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's terrible. <laughs> so and, what happens even, if, if you bonk, who, who's yeah, well, going to sweep it, you? <laughs> yes. And I had, I had my mule, but I had taken all the, sucked all the water out of it because I didn't want to carry that weight up power line. So I had right. no water. So I was stressing there a little bit, uh, hoping I'd run into somebody. Um, and, um, Luckily, right before uh, the road curves, before you get up to power line, there was a, a, a people packing up in a van, and I asked them if they had any water, and they had a nice gallon, so they were able to fill my mule up with it. So thank goodness mm-hmm. for that. Um, yeah. And actually, that's where I sort of – right after that is where I caught the next last rider was um, just right at the start of, of power line. And uh, he was probably my favorite guy from the day – for the day. Um, yeah, he was, he, was, he was a lot of fun. Why was that? Was, yeah. Well, he, he, his name was Jim. He was, I think he was from he's California, uh, central California. And mm. it was funny as we we're starting a power line, you know, it switched backs up a little bit there at the bottom and oh, yeah. someone was yelling down at him, Jim, get going. And it turned, it turned out it's his brother-in-law who was just ahead of him by a couple hundred yards. And, um, and as we're coming up the switchbacks, the specters came down and when they saw Jim, they started singing happy birthday to him. So I asked him what was going on. And he said, well, it's my 62nd birthday today. And my brother-in-law has kept telling everybody he goes by that it's my birthday so that they sing to me. And of course, you know, in, in the, uh, you know, all these spectators, of course, you know, this guy's way back there and they're just trying to help him out. So uh, they were singing to him and that happened all the way, the entire time I was with him, which was just <laughs> so much fun. 
It's just crazy. Oh, that's terrific. What a great brother-in-law, yeah. I, I guess. Unless you are having a really bad time. It's like, shut up. Oh, but Jim was one of those guys. He was more talkative. He was in, he was, mm-hmm. he was struggling, obviously, but he was in a, in a pretty good mood. And so, uh, um, we, you know, we, we, we saw his, you know, as, as, uh, power line straightened out, you could see his brother-in-law ahead of him. And we actually caught him up to him near the top for a little while. Um, so it was pretty, pretty fun. All right. And so uh, you, you get to the top of power line, um, and then it, uh, how, and you sort of flashing forward a little mm-hmm. bit, are you, uh, Anything special happened on the on, either on the way down Sugarloaf or as you were coming up May Queen? Yeah, so a couple of things. So actually, right near the top um, of Powerline, uh, we actually mm. came up to a guy I hadn't seen before, and and this guy was uh, actually walking his bike, but barely walking. And I asked him how he was doing, um, and he he looked really almost like white as a ghost kind of thing. Um, and he said he was toast. He had only had three bottles the entire race and one goo because he's had stomach oh, issues. No. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, that is, that's bad. Yeah. Um, and, and so I took a, you know, I took a harder look at him and he, he looked terrible. So I had seen the ATVs just behind me. Uh, so I, I left Jim to go ahead for a little while and I went, st- turned around, went about, uh, less than a quarter mile down, down, um, Mm-hmm. Uh, power line until I caught the ATVs and told them they needed to help this guy. So they came flying up and and uh, and took took good good care of him. So um, I called him in, let him know the ATVs were there and they were on the radio. Uh, they had the PA come up, and um, yeah, that's really all I knew of him. Other than a little bit later, I saw him. He was in the ATV and they were they came by taking him down. So, uh, but he totally needed IVs and probably something more. I, he he looked pretty bad. So. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, he, he'd been, I mean, you're burning around what, four or 500 calories an hour. And it sounds like he had consumed what, two or 300 calories in eight, nine hours. Yeah. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> he was, he was running a serious deficit. Your body can't operate under those, yeah. uh, un, under those circumstances and certainly not at that altitude. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I was surprised he was still standing. Yeah. Joe, is it, is it your understanding, though, that anybody that gets through that, that last checkpoint at Pipeline, they are, they are free to ride it all the way home if they can? Is that kind of the spirit of things out there? Well, I had thought that, uh, you know, 12 hours for the buckle and 13, and 13 hours is overall cutoff, but there's really no way to cut anybody off um, at 13 hours. You know, you yeah. sort of have to let hmm. them finish it out because they still have to get back. So at that point, right. it's just a matter of, you know, them getting back. And that's why it was probably, probably one of the most important areas. I make sure that there's nobody behind me. That's right. That's unaccounted for. Yeah, right. For that's what I'm that. getting to. Like, this is like the most important day, part of your job. Out of the whole day, this is probably it. Yeah. yeah. You've got to make sure there's no one laying in the trees somewhere or off the side of the trail. Right. Or looks like they're okay, but really not. Right. I mean... You yeah. can't, we can't have people out there in the middle of the night. And, and there's a risk there because especially on the, um, uh, the paved area there before Carter summit, I mean, if people can decide, Hey, I'm going to drop and they just decide on their own and take off down that road. Um, there is that some risk that people could just on their own drop and not tell uh-huh. anybody, but I don't think that happens, which is good. So, yeah. yeah Cause your job is to stay on the, uh, on the course though. Right. I mean, that's, yes. especially from here on in. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Stay on the dirt. Yeah. Right. So, uh, so anyway, so after, um, the paved area, um, uh, actually I lost Jim because I came up on another guy who's this mm-hmm. really big, one of those big muscly guys, uh, strong looking guy, but he was really hurting going up the paved road. He was cramping. And so he would get on the bike, spin for a while, then his quad would cramp up. And so he'd have to walk. Oh. Um, so that was, that was, you know, I really felt for him. He was, Man, he was struggling, but he was he was a trooper um, going up going up that paved road to Carter Summit. Um, so I was with him um, all the way until we got to that last aid station there at at Carter mm-hmm. Summit, and mm-hmm. and that crew. I mean, they had stayed to the bitter end. They were great. Uh, they gave us all kinds. About of... About what time of the day is it when you get to Carter? Oh my goodness, I'm guessing eleven and a half hours plus okay into the day okay. yep. yeah that sounds about right five five 
Somewhere in there, five o'clock? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point in time, I'm going, I wonder if I'm going to get in before dark. Because um, <laughs> that's something I hadn't thought of either. It's, I just had no idea how long it would take. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so the remaining so, uphill, uh, you know, because St. Kevin's after car summit at the aid station, there's still some climbing to do before you yep. get to the downhill. And there's probably four or five riders in my site. The, the big guy, Jim and his brother-in-law, and a couple other riders I saw um, that were sort of same kind of thing as I described on pipeline. Some would get ahead, some would get behind. Um, mm -hmm. And coming on the downhill, uh, you know, some of them were faster on the downhill and I caught up to this guy, John, I think it was from Minneapolis and he ended up being my last rider all the way in. Um, and he was really good natured. He was knew he was going to be in well after, uh, 12, actually after 13 hours as it turned out. And, um, <laughs> we, he didn't really walk much at all. Uh, he was riding just, you know, at a very slow, slow, steady pace, um, you know, all the way back down that road until we got to the boulevard. Um, you know, that, that little section at the beginning of the boulevard, that's really uh, steep that uh -huh. a lot of folks walked. So we did walk that. Um, and, and going up the boulevard, I could once again, see about five or six or seven riders up ahead of me stretched out. Um, so yeah, take us up sixth street now. I mean, what's that scene like as you, the red carpet comes into, or is the red carpet even still, what's it look like? Is the red carpet still there? Or is there still a, what's going well, on? Well, so as you know, as you know, the sixth street, it, there's a climb and then you have the crest of the hill and then you see the finish line way off in the distance. Uh, yep. so as we finally crested that hill, I could see up ahead and I saw, uh, it looked like Jim and his brother cause they were side by side finishing together. And I swear I heard, ha oh, I great. swear I heard happy birthday being sung. I swear <laughs> to God I did. And, and, uh, so what I decided to do is I, I radioed ahead and let them know, and I let the, uh, finish line know I was coming in with the last rider. So as we came down that hill and then, you know, the final 300, 400 yard grade up to the finish, they were announcing him coming in and everybody who was left there was clapping and cheering. So that was really, really cool. Uh, that was oh, cool, that's cool great. way to finish. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, timing wise, it was 7 50 PM when we finished mm -hmm. 7 50. So, so that's so 6 30 to 6 30 is 12. So or is 12 hours. So that makes you 13 and a half. So, so that's about 13 and a half hours that you're okay. Yeah, there. that's about right. Yeah. That's a day. It was. Yeah. That is a long time uh, on the bike. I, I should have, I should have used the chamois butter. That's, I can tell you that. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Yes. Always. Uh, so was there somebody there to greet you? Was Mar did Marilee put a medal around your neck? What, what happens there for you? Uh, well, I turned in my race radio and, um, basically just went up, um, the four or five blocks to uh, where we had stayed the night before, where I ran into Graham, my uh, buddy who had gotten there a, a bit, bit uh -huh. before. So uh, he had a beer waiting for me. So it was a good, it was a good, good day. <laughs> a great day. Awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. Very. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Very. So, so key learnings, key learnings from the day. Well, sort of taking them in order of the people I met and some of the things I saw, the, the first one is, it, uh, especially this is for first because almost every I have to mention almost every single person I met who's the last rider was a first timer uh -huh. mm. so the key thing there you is you learn a lot on that first time yes yeah. yes the key thing is number one don't ad, under, uh, underestimate the race especially what the altitude will do to you because it's nothing like where you live unless you live at high altitude and and if you if you really want to finish in, and finish in a reasonable time you got to get serious about getting some long rides in I preferably with some big amounts of climbing with big climbs. Yeah. Yep. And for those folks, cause like, um, Flo Florida, New York, uh, Texas, uh, these are some of the folks I met who, you know, they really didn't have good Hills around them. You know, I don't know what you can do about that. Maybe if you can drive a couple hours to where there's some good climbs, that's worthwhile doing at least maybe once every two or three weeks on a long weekend day. Um, mm -hmm. but th that's going to yep. be a key, key challenge for some of those folks, but anything you can do to get some of those good climbs in, I think that will help you a lot once you get to Leadville. Um, yeah. Good climbs and good descents. I mean, it, 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 almost infamously people talk about Leadville as being a non-technical race mm -hmm. and that is just, 
I mean, there is a lot of area that where you are just grinding along, not on autopilot, but uh, without needing to with without needing to necessarily focus on a line. Yeah. But there are parts where knowing how to ride a mountain bike definitely is a critical skill. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you don't want to uh, come to Leadville with uh, no experience on a mountain bike. Yeah, the downhills are important. Like that one woman I mentioned who was coming down a uh, power line, mm -hmm. you could lose a ton of time uh, if you're completely uncomfortable on those downhills. That's for sure. That's a good point. Yeah. Yep. Um, the other thing, obviously, and it, I'm sure you've mentioned this in other podcasts that I've listened to, is the eating and drinking habits. Uh, as soon oh, yeah. as you could emulate those on your rides, that's that's pretty critical. Uh, I'm not sure what happened to that one guy I mentioned who was in serious trouble, but if you if you can, you know, eat and drink like you're going to do it on a ride, um, and it's hard to do because you know it's hard enough to do in the race because you know do you want to hour in you want to stop and grab a goo and drink it or you just want to keep going but you have to have that rigor and discipline to eat and drink at regular times and yep. it's funny i the first race i did with a camelback the the one in 2017 i didn't i did it with water bottles and assuming i get in next year uh with the volunteer hours i i would do a camelback again because i just drink so much more when i have that it's so much easier to access so um yeah yeah hmm. yeah and and your your first point there is so right. You got to train it like you're going to race it. You got to eat uh, eat the foods you're going to eat during the race. You got to drink the uh, drink that you're going to drink during the race, and you got to use the delivery system that you're going to use during the race. Whether it's yeah. bottles, camel packs, whatever you're going to use, got to be yeah. good at it, right? Because yeah. you, 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 you're going to be doing it yeah. all day. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey. Don't assume you're you're going to be in. You're in. And if you're not in, you let us know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we'll use this podcast to raise a little help. <laughs> we'll squat. Oh, no. I, Rich was really nice. He said, you know, uh, you, you, uh, you you put in a ton of hours. I think you'll be at the top of the volunteer list when you apply. So I'm, I'm not too worried about that. So cool. And what a Hopefully great it's... experience of volunteering. I mean, that is just uh, that is just a terrific story. And, you know, you got a, a little window into a lot of other people's amazing stories. You know, whether they finished the race uh, or didn't finish the race, you know, everyone out there. And you got to see a little bit of their story and be part of it. That is fantastic. And it's a real appreciation for all the people who come up here even trying to do it. And yep. even if they're not going to finish the determination is a stronger, stronger than anybody else in the race for most of these folks. So that's really cool to see. All right, Joe, that's a really terrific story. Thanks for uh, coming on and sharing with us. We we do appreciate all the the tidbits and the insights there along a, a led. It's the part of the race that Fatty and I have never had a chance to hear about or hear from. So it's it's really cool to get your perspective. Well, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank all you right. so much. Fatty, let's wrap up uh, Season 2, Episode 25 of the Leadville Podcast, presented by Floyd's of Leadville. We're always interested in great race stories like the one you just heard. So if you had something crazy or magnificent or tragic or triumphant happen to you during uh, your go at the LT100, please drop us a line. To do so, head to the Leadville100podcast.com comment section and get in touch. Yep, and also while you're at it and you're online and not on your bike, follow me on Twitter. I'm at Fat Cyclist, and Hottie is at Michael Houghton. You can also find us both on Facebook. We're active in the Leadville 100 MTV Participants Group. And if you like our show, support it by giving us a five-star rating and review over at Apple Podcasts. Also share it with your other cycling friends and support our sponsors. Let them know you appreciate them making this show possible. Everyone, thanks for listening. Joe, thanks for telling us your story. And we will see you, Joe, and everyone else at the 2020 starting line.